Art is more than just a picture. It is the interpretation of the human heart. Christian art is even more, for it is the expression of one's faith, trust, and surrender to Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. As Christians, we do not worship art any more than a preacher would worship his sermons. Both are a way of telling the world the good news of God's great love. Someone has said that a picture is worth a thousand words. This is just saying that we remember far more of what we see than of what we hear. We live today in a world of pictures. I want to tell you the fascinating true story of how this picture that the artist is reproducing came to be painted. In 1892, a baby boy was born in a Christian home in Chicago. His name was Warner Saltman. Even as a young boy, he was greatly impressed by the Bible pictures he saw each week at Sunday school. The Bible illustrations done by the Christian artist Guster Dorr seemed to set his heart on fire, and he felt at a very early age that one day he would like to become a Christian artist. His church encouraged him in his hopes and dreams, and his dedicated teachers steered him in his artistic interest. At the age of 14, Warner began an apprenticeship in art while also studying evenings at the Art Institute in Chicago. Nine long years of persistent work won for him the only certificate ever given for evening work in the Institute's history. While at the same time he was studying art, he took classes at the Bible Institute. It was while he was at the Bible Institute that Warner was challenged to great Christian art. One day, Dean Sellers asked him, I understand you're an artist. Well, uh, I like to draw anyway, Warner replied. Good. Keep right at it. We need Christian artists. I hope sometime you will give us your conception of Christ. Most of the pictures I have seen are too effeminate. I hope you'll picture a manly Christ. You mean you think that Jesus was more a rugged type? Warner asked. Exactly, replied Dean Sellers. He lived and worked out of doors, so he must have been tan. He was a man's man who set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. His was a masculine face, like that of strength and power. That's the picture we need, Solomon, and I hope you will do it someday. For a long time, the youthful artist had been struck with the inadequate way in which Christ was usually pictured. He shared the dean's feeling of discontent with the sad, weary, picturizations of Christ so often seen. He felt that the face of Christ should be one of beautiful but rugged simplicity. He hoped someday to make such a picture. Warner was inspired to finally do such a picture at the age of 31. This is the way that it all happened. He was serving as art editor of a Christian youth magazine and had the responsibility to work out with the art staff the illustrations and cover designs for the entire year. At the staff meeting, no one had a satisfactory suggestion for the Christian life issue, which was to appear in February 1924. Since Solomon himself had no real good suggestion to offer, he did not feel that he should assign the responsibility to come up with something to somebody else. Therefore, the matter was left in his hands. The picture had to be finished, and in the hands of the engraver early in January in order to make the February issue. For a long time he meditated on the theme, trying to find something that would really challenge youth, but still nothing came to mind. On the day before the deadline, he worked late at his drawing board, but to no avail. At last, he retired for the night. Disturbed and worried that he might not come through in time, he just could not sleep. Finally, in the early morning hours, said the artist, there emerged in one luminous moment a 
a visual picturization of the head of Christ so clear and definite that I could almost see it on the paper. I hastily went upstairs to my studio and made a small thumbnail sketch of the picture before the image got away from me. The next day I made an enlarged charcoal drawing which was completed just in time for the deadline. The picture was a challenge to all who saw it. Today we know it as the famous head of Christ found in homes around the world. In this picture, Jesus is portrayed as mature, yet youthful, courageous, yet humble, manly, yet compassionate, practical, yet mystical, friendly, yet lonely. In Jesus, all of these qualities of character are in perfect harmony. It was from this first picture of Christ that the picture of Christ at door was based. This is one of the most complete and fascinating portrayals of the gospel that has ever been painted. Every detail in the picture has a message that blends together in a composition to produce a symphony in color. It is taken from and inspired by the scripture in Revelation 3.20 in which Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will fellowship with him and he with me. Notice the details that Solomon so carefully painted that speaks a special message to you as Christ stands at your heart's door. First, notice the sturdy oak door with its heavy wrought iron hinges set carefully in the solid stone masonry. This might be the side entrance to a church. Could it be that Christ is knocking at the door of a church which is closed to the Spirit of God? But if you look carefully, you will see that the light which radiates from the figure of Christ flows into every part of the doorway and the canopy immediately overhead, tracing the shape of the human heart. This is a very narrow door because it is the door to the individual heart. Only one at a time may approach. Second, there is the garden in the foreground. It is all that now remains of what once was a beautiful formal garden. Now the unkept growth of thistles and underbrush is crowded about the flowers and vines grow up the walls. This is the garden of neglect. Perhaps it was once a garden of prayer such as Jesus visited so often. Christ has somehow made his way through that neglect to this door which is closed and bolted. So long has the garden been abandoned that the birds in the original picture had built their nest in the eaves above the door. The heavy oak timbers indicate that the door will not easily yield to force. Jesus will go no further without an invitation. Christ is the central figure of this pictorial message. His presence completely dominates the scene. The flowers reach out to touch the hem of his garment. By skillful artistic devices, Solomon draws our eyes to the face and figure of Christ. His white seamless robe flows with a dazzling beauty. The spotless purity of his robe suggests that here is the transcendent Christ whose spiritual power and grace have amazed the world for 2,000 years. By the grace of God, the eternal goodness of the Father and the need of mortal man meet over the threshold of this door. Even the light that spotlights the door, forming the shape of the human heart, comes from the being of the figure of Christ. This is the King of glory who seeks entrance into your heart. But now look back at the door again. Do you see the grill set in this solid oak door? The grill work reveals that there is darkness inside. Solomon said, The grill is there so that the individual may see who is at the door. 
By responding to the knock, he may have a view of the presence before letting him in. It is just possible that there are many people who have had a glimpse of the Savior from time to time who have not responded to his knock. This door, tightly closed, is a symbol of man's rebellion. The Bible says that our hearts are infected by a spiritual disease. This it calls sin. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Christ with supernatural ability is able to see beyond the door to our true condition. Jesus said, Far from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Have you ever thought that by shutting the door of your heart against God, you were cutting off your sin from the view of Almighty God? All of us have felt that way, but things don't work that way. God knows what is on the inside. He knows your thoughts. He knows your life. When you walk out of a church on Sunday, you're not leaving God behind. God doesn't dwell in houses made with human hands. He is right out there where you are. He goes with you. He knows what kind of person you really are. God knows the sin in your life, the lust in your heart, the moral decay of your soul, the profanity of your lips, the hypocrisy of your witness, and the pride of your look. God knows, and the Bible says that while God loves the sinner, he hates the sin. God hates sin so much that in his divine justice, he has decreed the death penalty on all those who have sinned. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But the death that God demands is far greater than physical death. It is spiritual death, death that is damning death that is eternal, and death that is separation from the very presence of God himself. The Bible has one word to describe this death. It is the word hell. The wages of sin is hell. Then what hope is there for you or me? In ourselves there is none whatsoever. The Bible clearly teaches that all have sinned. There is no good work that you can do to make things right between you and God. But there is a way out. God has provided it on the cross. Jesus did far more than teach man a moral code of ethics. Jesus paid the penalty for you at the cross. He never sinned. Yet he died. The reason he died was to take your penalty upon himself to become your substitute in order to completely satisfy the great justice of God and to provide a way of life, new life, eternal life, abundant life for you right now. Jesus experienced the hellish death of a sinner's cross for you. God wants to do spiritual surgery on your heart. He says, I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. The surgeon's scalpel is found in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick, sharp, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How far are you from eternity? Just place your hand over your heart. Can you feel it beating there inside? Faithful it beats, hour after hour, minute after minute. But one day it will stop. Right now, you are just one heartbeat away from eternity. Christ stands at your heart's door right now. But there is a key to this masterpiece, the latch. Where is it? The place where the latch might be is hidden, but the artist intended for the door to have no latch from the outside. 
The door to the heart can be opened only from within. The soul itself is the key. You must open the door. Christ knocks at your heart's door today. His purpose is not to intrude, but to take his place as a welcome guest who will give light and life to your heart. He will forgive the sin. He will remove the tangled weeds and thorns that have taken control of your life. He will give you a new life, one with direction and purpose. The picture would be incomplete without the one most important scarlet touch, the nail print in his hand. This is the living, resurrected Christ that comes and knocks at your heart's door. He has gone to the cross, paid the penalty for your sins, triumphed over the grave in death, and now comes to offer you the gift of life. If only you will open your heart and by faith invite him to come in. Jesus is gently knocking. He does not seek to tear the door down. He just waits and listens with a keen expectancy, like a doctor listening for the sign of life. Right now, open your heart and invite him to come in. How does one become a Christian? First, you must realize that God loves you and wants you to have a wonderful new life. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Second, you must confess your sins to God. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means all men are sinners. God compares all men with Jesus Christ, his son. Are you as good and perfect as Jesus Christ? No one is as good as Jesus it is sin that separates you from God the Father. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, which is spiritual separation from God. That is a death in eternity. It is a death in hell. Third, God's good news is that Jesus Christ died on the cross that you might have this new life. Jesus died on the cross for you. He bridged the gap from God to man. God showed his love for you by sending Christ to pay the penalty for your sins. Jesus took your sin, your death, your judgment, and your place on the cross. He became your substitute. Then after three days in the grave, he came back from the dead. In this way, God has clearly shown that he loves you. God loves you personally. The Bible says, God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This new life in Jesus Christ is a free gift from God. You cannot get it by just living a good life. God's word says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Fourth. The good news from God is that by receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have this new life. The Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To receive Christ means turning from sin and self to Christ, and trusting him to forgive your sins, to remove the guilt, and to give you a wonderful new life. It means to make Jesus Christ the Lord in your life. You receive Christ by personal invitation. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That is the door of your heart, the door of your life. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Through prayer, receive Christ by faith right now. Begin a new life in Christ right now. Turn from sin to Christ. God says in his word, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whosoever includes you. If you will turn from your sin, place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
and ask him into your life and heart right now. Prayer is simply talking with God. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and life right now. To receive Christ into your heart and life, you can pray to him and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I am willing to turn from my sin. I believe you died on the cross to take away my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Take control of my life. And make me into the kind of person you want me to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you.